You're listening to the All Things ADHD podcast. Hello, I'm your host, Melvin Bogart. My guest today is Dr. Roberto Olivardia. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So please tell me more about you and your work. Sure. I am a clinical psychologist and a lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. I specialize in the treatment of ADHD, as well as uh, working with eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, a body dysmorphic disorder. Um, I see patients of all ages and specifically with ADHD, see a lot of people with ADHD and comorbid uh, disorders like ADHD and binge eating disorder or bipolar disorder, substance abuse, um, and uh, really happy to be here in this podcast. Well, we are happy to have you. So today we're discussing challenges in ADHD care for children of color. Uh, so my first question is, do cultural barriers exist in the healthcare and school system when correctly identifying ADHD in African-American children? And if so, how do we change the narrative? Absolutely. I mean, this is such a, an, an important topic. You know, in the research literature, studies actually show that ADHD can be either very under-identified and underdiagnosed or over-diagnosed. And for all you know, the, the wrong reasons in the sense that, so with, we take under-identification, what we know is that there are a lot of barriers that get in the way for children of color. Um, having you know, insurance issues, being uninsured, underinsured. Um, a lot of times school systems are the first, sort of the gatekeepers of first identifying students. And if children of color who might be in school systems that may not be um, particularly adequate or staffed or have the specialists to make those kind of identifications, um, a lot of times uh, what studies show is that children of, of color are sometimes more likely to be diagnosed with another issue and not ADHD, such as being oppositional or having conduct disorder, um, as opposed to seeing that this could be ADHD or an undiagnosed learning disability. Um, even getting assessed in you know, testing. So if you don't go through your school system um, to get you know, private assessment, it costs money. Um, and it's not often not covered by insurance. Um, there could be long waiting lists um, in that. So you have from an institutional perspective, studies also show that healthcare providers carry a lot of implicit biases around how we diagnose. Um, there was a study actually done where uh, physicians were given the same scenario of symptoms. And in one scenario, it was uh, a individual, Caucasian individual, and another person who was an African-American individual. And the African-American individual was more likely to be given a diagnosis of schizophrenia versus the Caucasian individual, ADHD. Um, and so when it, we're talking about the same symptoms, and this isn't necessarily, I'm not saying that physicians are all racist necessarily, but there is a lot of bias that you know we have to continue to unpack around how we look at behavior and really understanding the cultural context of this. Now, where it can get overdiagnosed, sometimes uh, children of color get diagnosed with ADHD without really looking at other potential issues such as trauma, such as um, you know the, the experience of racism and the distrust that a lot of uh, people in the African-American community have towards medical professionals, which is warranted and justified. If we you know, look at historically everything from the Tuskegee you know, experiments, if you wanna call it that, and, um, and just a lot of injustices that have happened in the African-American community, so a lot of times, you know, even providers have to understand that when you're working with a person of color that, and this is, in, this is regardless too of socioeconomic status, studies show that, you know, in African-American communities that there is, there's a real vulnerability that they feel in um, just, especially for a parent who's bringing their child to get diagnosed and what that means. So we, there's a lot to unpack there.
Let's discuss the challenges of African-American children if they are not properly diagnosed or treated for ADHD in the early childhood. What are some of the problems maybe you've seen in your practice? With ADHD in general, when you don't have proper identification, proper diagnosis, then you don't get proper treatment and management. And ADHD um, you know, is one of those diagnoses that unfortunately a lot of people in popular culture, we sort of see it as, oh, you know, I'm so ADD in this kind of fad diagnosis. This is a diagnosis that can cause real um, ruin in somebody's life if it's not managed and, and not treated well. Um, and, you know, particularly people with ADHD, when it's unmanaged, have higher risks of substance abuse, um, are going to face more problems in jobs and potential unemployment, more relationship problems. Uh, Russell Barkley uh, published a study recently looking at the health outcomes of people with ADHD, where they have a, a shorter life expectancy. I, I should say unmanaged, untreated ADHD. I always want to clarify that. Um, and in terms of um, diet in terms of paying attention to one's health. So now you imagine, you know, an individual, uh, you know, a, a child of color who is not being identified. And on top of that is being labeled as being oppositional, as being uh, difficult. And then growing up in a culture in which there are institutions that make it very difficult for people of color um, to move forward. You know, we, there is a, a lot of racist um, institutional policies and, um, and all of those implicit biases that whether it's people in, you know, professionals within the school system and just the trauma of racism and the trauma that all of that entails really makes for a perfect storm in terms of all of these problems that can happen and particularly in adolescence. And if you have, um, you know, particularly for a lot of people of color who might grow up, let's say in single parent families, parents do the best that they can do and with the resources that they have. And it's very difficult if someone isn't being identified and, you know, they, they might not have the monitoring or supervision because their parent might be working two or three jobs that it makes it really, really difficult. And then by the time that person is a teenager and let's say they're using substances and you know they're doing things that one quote unquote should not be doing, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, this is you know a bad quote unquote a bad kid, as opposed to looking down the line and understanding, well, if you felt like a failure every day when you went to work, and for kids, school is their job, and you weren't being properly identified, diagnosed, and helped then how are you going to think about yourself? And then on top of that, again, the experience of racism, of discrimination, of prejudice on top of that. So there's this sort of double impact that that experience can have. What are some factors that can increase disparities in diagnosing and treating ADHD? So first, I think, is really understanding the cultural context of where uh, people of color could be coming from, again, in terms of the stigma um, that we know just in general, there's a lot of stigma of mental health diagnoses. Um, the ADHD diagnosis, I would say that thankfully, the stigma of that overall is decreasing. Um, however, I should say that in a lot of those studies they're showing it's decreasing amongst Caucasian white individuals. So a lot of um, people uh, who are white, you know, will often, particularly young people that I work with will say, oh yeah, I have lots of friends who have ADHD and are on medication. It's just, it's, you know, no big deal. Um, and that's not to say that there isn't some impacts, you know, that can happen with Caucasian individuals, but overall you see that stigma decreasing. With communities of color, it's very important for mental health professionals, for phys physicians to understand that it has a very different context that, you know, the idea that in a lot of um, immigrant families or people of color, the idea that if there's a problem, it's looked at as this is a problem of the family. And a lot of times parents feel very um, like it's an indictment on their parenting in that way, that they're not whipping their kids into shape. They're not, um, you know, keeping them in line in, in that sort of way because discipline is, is really important. And so part, part of our job as professionals is to understand where they're coming from. And it's not that they're being 
parents, let's say, are being defensive or they're not being cooperative um, or they're being distrustful as if it's unwarranted, we have to understand where they're coming from. And our education and outreach has to be on, look, this is not an indictment on your parenting at all. Is that and your kid is not a bad kid? Is that this is something and and really explain the science behind it that they can still be successful individuals? Because imagine again, you know, for every parent who ha has a child of color, the they're always thinking and worried about the kind of world that they're going to grow up in, and we know with you know, just everything that's been happening, you know, lately and has, well, has always been happening, but has really made it um, more in the news landscape around uh, police brutality that we know that, um, you know, parents who have children of color have that conversation. And that's something that a lot of like white parents don't think, oh, I'm going to have a conversation with my white child about the cops. Like, that's not something that we you know, would, would necessarily think that most white families would experience. So similarly, we have to have the conversation around diagnosis, um, and especially with treatment. Now, what studies also show is that with communities of color, that even when um, children of color are diagnosed, they're not getting the proper treatment. So, so now you have these barriers to even get diagnosed, to get identified, to get assessed. And then there are these barriers of, of treatment. And part of it is on one end, again, of insurance issues, of um, accessibility. Um, you know, there is a, a dearth of um, clinicians of color um, in in communities. I mean, I think with physicians, I think it's five percent of physicians are African American. Um, it's very very low, you know, uh, amount. So we have work even on that end, you know, of of trying to um, you know bring in people of color in the field. But in addition, with something like medication, that that you know, there's again this sort of resistance that you'll often see in communities of color who are like, well, what is this medication going to do? That there's this sort of distrust, is this sort of this form of keeping somebody in line or of social control. And we need to, again, not as a as a professional, we can look at that as like, oh, this is someone who's defensive and, and whatnot, without looking at the cultural context of historically what that means for somebody, you know, when you're giving a medication, like what, what are we trying to do? We're not trying to have your child necessarily be like everybody else and um, as much as be the best version of themselves. So I see a, a large factor is our ability, and this is why I'm glad we're doing this podcast, of just getting the messaging out and the outreach out of how we have to speak to these communities as opposed to the assumption being, oh, they're they need to understand or, you know, they're being defensive, they're closed minded, you know, those kinds of things. And we need more representation too. Of, um, you know, there are some celebrities out there like Simone Biles, the Olympic, you know, athlete, she, you know, talks about having ADHD and um, Will I Am, I'm a big music fan. So Will I Am, a black eyed peas talked about having ADHD. It's, um, and then there are people who I've, I've not heard them themselves say, but reportedly, you know, may have it. And, you know, it, we want to try to bring out um, famous people who have ADHD who just provide some more visibility and let people know that it's okay and that this is not something that's going to follow your child in a negative way, which, again, if you are a parent of a child of color, you worry about their future. You worry about them having as many options because you know, unfortunately, today that there's, there's a going to be these forces that work against them. So you don't want a label that you think is going to limit them, that is going to brand them and have them stand out in a negative way. We need to let them know, no, that's not the case. In fact, if it's not diagnosed, if it's not treated, then the problems that can come from that are the things that end up labeling them in negative ways and limit their opportunities. This is actually meant to increase their opportunities in that way. What do you suggest to African-American parents of children with ADHD when advocating uh, for their child with a non-culturally aware school system or medical clinician? Yeah, so I think first and foremost is to really empower parents to know it's okay for them and, and more than okay for them 
to ask for more if their child is not getting what they need. And I think a lot of times, um, particularly, you know, in communities of color, the messaging is, you know, to, to not ask for much um, and to sort of be silent and, and be grateful for what you have, you know, and that sort of thing, as opposed to, well, wait a minute, my child is not, is flailing here and they're not getting the services that they need. And it can be, again, we to understand, you know, if you are a a parent or parents of color, and you are sitting across a room of you know people who are not you know of color in the school system, where there is a inherent power dynamic, that that's going to bring up a lot of different feelings and a lot of different emotions. And so, to let parents know, it is they're entitled. Their child is entitled to an education. We all are entitled, you know, to that. To let them know too that sometimes even with the assessments, like studies, you know, show that there's often a disparity. A lot of times when um, children of color are assessed, you know, you have or any child is assessed. You have a parent fill out a survey, teachers fill out surveys, and and you sort of look for consistencies. Well, studies show that in communities of color, you'll often see these inconsistencies where teachers might rate one way, parents rate another way. And that doesn't mean that there isn't ADHD. It's understanding that if you are growing up in a single parent family, the level of responsibilities you might have in that household are far greater. And so in some ways, you know, I've, I've heard from people who have said, I didn't have room to procrastinate at home because I had to cook dinner. I needed to, you know, help my, my mom who was working two, three jobs. And then in school, it just was a totally different thing. It's understanding, not just looking at these surveys and these like, oh, you don't check all the boxes and really understanding and letting parents know to share their observations, share their story in terms of what their child is going through. Find people in the community. A lot of times, you know, word of mouth and working with other parents, hearing from other parents who have had children in, in that way. Um, in communities of color, whether it's, you know, through Facebook groups or things like that, but also through churches or through venues in which people feel a safety and a trust. And it's okay. Parents can know that they can bring an advocate, let's say, to an IEP meeting and support them because these the meetings can be very emotional, especially if somebody is saying, oh, no, we don't think your child needs that. Or again, if a child is being diagnosed with ADHD and they may not have ADHD, it could be a child who is not eating because there's food insecurity in the household, um, that they're not sleeping well. And so we always want to be looking at the big picture. And this is true for everybody. But what we know from the research is that children of color are, again, that overdiagnosis or underdiagnosis is that we're, we're missing the mark, that there isn't enough attention looking at the context of how all of these things play out. And so for parents is to educate themselves, listen to these kinds of podcasts, get you know information, talk to their child's pediatrician, talk to trusted people in the community, really looking at sort of resources that help them just give themselves information and come to those school meetings with that information. Those were some good suggestions. Any last words? Anyone who hears this, if this motivates them to do a research study, to do a podcast about this, to interview um, you know, people of clinicians of color, physicians of color, in talking to their communities, to religious leaders around how we can look at the conversation of mental health. That's what we just need to do is keep keep talking. Thank you. Oh, Thank my, you. my pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of All Things ADHD. To learn more about ADHD, visit Chad at chadd.org. Gee.